All right. I think we are good to go. Go ahead and start out with a quick prayer in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, be with us and guide this meeting together with uh, the speaker and the listeners and uh, hear us all when we say with all thanksgiving as we approach uh, the lessons of your Holy Cross, let it be for us a seal of glory and a sign for our victory over all challenges in our life. And hear us when we say with all thanksgiving, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. So we're now progressing in our Lent series here, and we're blessed to have uh, one of our awesome St. Basil servants uh, who will give the talk today. Um, uh, Sharif is a longstanding servant at St. Basil's and other churches as well. And uh, he does many things in our church, and I uh, also appreciate his ability to do a lot of research on any topic. So I thought he would be perfect uh, for one of these uh, series talks. And so with that, I'll hand it off to Sharif. Thank you, Sharif, for taking the time to do this. Thank you, Abuna. I appreciate it. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Can I get a confirmation that uh, you guys can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. So uh, as uh, uh, you may have seen in the announcements, you know, as part of the series on uh, the salvation um, through the cross of Christ in the Old Testament, uh, the topic today was uh, the story of the deliverance of Susanna or Susanna, I guess, uh, depends on how you want to pronounce it. Um, so that's what, um, you know, I figured we would, um, you know, cover uh, essentially the context of this book, um, where it's placed in the scripture, where it fits in the liturgy of the church. Uh, we're actually going to go ahead and read the book because it's not very long. It's not a book. It's actually uh, just a chapter. Uh, it's one chapter. So we will read it. Um, and then we will try to relate it to, uh, you know, the story of salvation. Um as affected uh, by Christ through the cross. Okay. Um, so the story of Susanna is actually part of the book of Daniel. Um, so it is in our Bible, uh, the Bible. Um, neither Jewish people nor Protestants uh, have this chapter uh, in the book of Daniel, but it is part of the Septuagint, which is the, um, you know, the Old Testament um, of the Orthodox Church. Uh, and it's also in the Catholic Church. Um, so this is a canonical book for us. Uh, it's not Apocrypha. We should not be calling these books Apocrypha. It is a, you know, it's just part of the book of Daniel. Depending on which manuscript you're looking at, sometimes it's early on, uh, you know, after chapter one or chapter three, sometimes it's the last chapter. Um, nonetheless, it's there. And we have fathers of the church also defending its canonicity. Um, and we have, you know, since Ambrose, uh, Hippolytus, uh, and even Origen uh, defending uh, this as uh, canonicity. There is a conspiracy theory, um, I think, by Origen that says, um, you know, that Jewish elders ended up removing it because it put Jewish elders in a bad light because of the contents of the story. Um, and you will see that in a second. Maybe there is something to it. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of the uh, story itself, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought I heard an echo. Uh, in terms of the story itself, here's the outline. Um, it starts with introduction of Susanna and the elders. There's an attempt uh, essentially to attack Susanna uh, and assault her. Um, when she refuses to sin, the elders accuse her of committing adultery, uh, that they caught her committing adultery. Um, they have a trial for her where they bear false witness against her. They lead her to her death. And then uh, the scripture says that God hears her cry, arouses the spirit of a young man named Daniel, or arise, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit is arisen in, in a young man named Daniel, who then essentially shows that the two elders are bearing false witness, and uh, Susanna is uh, saved from a certain death. So we're actually going to go ahead and read the story. Abuna, if you want to uh, do the honors, please, since this is typically done 
uh, by the priest uh, on a, uh, Great and Holy Saturday. Please go ahead. Uh, it be my blessing to go ahead and read this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. There was a man living in Babylon, and his name was Joachim. His, he took a wife whose name was Susanna, the daughter of Helkea, a very beautiful woman and one who feared the Lord. Her parents were righteous and taught her daughter according to the law of Moses. Joachim was exceedingly wealthy with a spacious garden adjoining his house, and the Jews came to him because he was the most honored of them all. In that year, two elders from the people were appointed as judges concerning whom the Lord said, Lawlessness came forth out of Babylon from the elders who were judges, who were supposed to govern the people. These men were frequently at Joachim's house, and all who had judgments came to him. Now when the people departed at midday, Susanna would go into her husband's garden to walk. So the two elders would see her going in and walking about every day, and they desired her. They turned away their heart and averted their eyes from looking to heaven and from remembering the righteous judgments. Both were pierced to the heart for her, but they did not tell each other their pain. They were ashamed to inform one another of their desire because they wished to have relations with her. So every day they eagerly watched to see her. Finally, they said to one another, let us go home for it is time for it is the time for the midday meal. And going out, they parted from each other. But turning back, they met again, and they, pres they pressured each other for the reason. They confessed their desire. Together, they arranged for a time they could find her alone. Then it came to pass, while they were waiting for the opportune day, she went in as before with only two maids. She also wished to bathe in the garden, for it was hot. For no one was there except the two elders who hid themselves and were watching her. She said to her maids, bring me oil and ointments and shut the doors of the garden that I may bathe. They did as she said and closed the garden doors. They went out by the side doors to bring the things commanded, but did not see the elders because they were hidden. When the maids left, the two elders arose and ran to her and said, look, the doors of the garden are closed and no one will see us and we desire you. Therefore, Give us your consent and lie with us. If you do not, we will testify that a young man was with you, and because of this you sent your maids away from you. Then Susanna sighed deeply and said, I am hemmed in on all sides, for if I do this thing, it is death for me. Yet if I do not, I will not escape your hands. But it is better for me not to do it and to fall into your hands than to sin against the Lord. Then Susanna cried out with a loud voice, and the two elders cried out against her. One of them ran and opened the garden doors. When the household servants heard the cry in the garden, they rushed in by the side doors to see what had happened to her. So when the elders told her tale, the servants were deeply ashamed, for such a report had never been made about Susanna. Then it came to pass the next day when the people assembled at the house of Joachim, her husband, and the two elders also came full of their lawless purpose against Susanna to have her put to death. They said before all the people, send for Susanna, the daughter of Elkiah, who is the wife of Joachim. So they sent for her and she came with her parents, her children and all her kindred. Now Susanna was very desirable and beautiful to behold. However, she was veiled. Thus the lawless men commanded she be unveiled so as to enjoy her beauty. But her friends and all who saw her wept. Then the elders arose in the midst of the people and laid their hands upon her head. She wept and looked up to heaven, for her heart trusted in the Lord. The two elders said, As we were walking in the garden alone, this woman came in with two maids, closed the doors of the garden, and dismissed the maids. Then a young man who was hidden came to her and lie with her. Now we were in the corner of the garden and saw this lawlessness. So we ran to them and saw them having relations, but we could not hold the man for he was stronger than me. He then opened the doors and rushed out. So we seized this woman and asked her who the young man was, but she was unwilling to tell us. Thus the assembly believed them as they were elders and judges among the people. So they commanded her to death. 
they condemned her to death. But Susanna cried out with a loud voice and said, O eternal God, who know both what is secret and all things before they come to be, you know these men testified against me falsely, and behold, I shall die, though I did none of the things they wickedly invented against me. The Lord heard her voice, and as she was being led away to be put to death, God aroused the Holy Spirit of a young boy whose name was Daniel. He cried out with a loud voice, I am innocent of the blood of this woman. So all the people turned to him and said, What is this thing you said? Then he stood in their midst and said, Are you such fools, O sons of Israel, without examination or knowledge of the evidence? Have you condemned a daughter of Israel? Return to the place of judgment, for these men testified against her falsely. So all the people returned with haste. The elders said to him, Come sit in our midst and inform us, for God gives you that privilege. Daniel then said to them, Separate them far from each other, and I will examine them. When they were separated from each other, he summoned one of them and said to him, You old man of evil days, now the sins you committed in earlier days have come home. For you pronounce unjust judgments, condemn the innocent, and set the guilty free. Yet the Lord said, You shall not kill the innocent and the righteous. Now then, if indeed you saw her, tell me, under which tree did you see them being intimate with each other? He replied, Under the mastic tree. Daniel then said, Plainly, you lied against your own head, for even now the angel of God receives the sentence from God, and he shall cut you in two. Then he removed him and commanded them to bring the other. He said to him, You seed of Canaan and not of Judah. Beauty deceived you and desire turned away your heart. This is how both of you deal with the daughters of Israel, and they have been intimate with you through fear. But a daughter of Judah would not endure your lawlessness. Now then, tell me, under what tree did you catch them being intimate with each other? He replied, under the evergreen oak. Daniel said to him, Plainly you also lied against your own head, for the angel of God is waiting with his sword to cut you in two, that he may destroy both of you. Then the whole assembly cried out with a loud voice, Bless God who saves those who hope in him. So they rose up against the two elders, for Daniel convicted them out of their own mouth for bearing false witness. And they did to them the thing they maliciously intended to do against their neighbor. For acting in accordance with the law of Moses, they put them to death. Therefore, innocent blood was saved on that day. Hilkiah and his wife praised God for their daughter. With joy came her husband and all her kindred, because nothing shameful was found in her. Thus Daniel had a great reputation among the people from that day onward. And glory be to God for her. Thank you so much, Abuna. Really appreciate it. Um, there's a reason why I underlined that verse specifically. So it's a teaser. We'll get to it uh, in a little bit. Um, hey, uh, Sharif, Sharif, just real quick. Some people are yes. waiting to be in. To, to, okay. To be let. Just keep. Does that mean, sorry, do I have to do something? or? Yes, just admit them into the room. Just push admit. So go to the people. On oh, the I see. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, I didn't realize that if uh, I get that ability, then yes, you don't have that ability. Okay, sorry about that. I'll keep that window open. Sorry, I don't use Zoom on a regular basis anymore, so I apologize. Okay. All right. Um, so thank thank you, Abuna, so much for uh, for reading the chapter. Um, like I said, the... Uh, this is uh, a chapter in, in the book of Daniel in, in our Bible. Uh, it's not there in, um, you know, the Jewish Old Testament or in the Protestant Bible. It's it's uh, missing. Uh, but actually, the story is uh, very important to the point where it's included in the church's liturgy. So the story is read once a year. Um, it's um, in the midnight praise of Great and Holy Saturday. So after Great and Holy Friday is over, the 12th hour of Great and Holy Friday, you know, we go home, we rest a bit, then we come back uh, around midnight, um, you know, between Friday and Saturday, and we begin the midnight praise of Great and Holy Saturday. And this prophecy um, is read uh, during the midnight praise. And actually, it is the prophecy that concludes 
the midnight parade. So it's actually given a very prominent uh, place within all of the readings of uh, Bright and Holy Saturday. And as I said, there's tradition that you know the priest uh, reads the story because of its significance to give it to give it more weight. And actually, the story continues a common theme. There's a thread that ties together all of the readings of the prophecies. Uh, almost all of them, uh, in uh, the Midnight Praise of Great and Holy Saturday. So if you were to look at uh, the readings, and here um, it's a selection of them, it's not all of them, um, but uh, there is actually a common theme, and let's see if we can figure out what it is. So uh, how many Psalms are there? Not 150, it's actually 151. So the Midnight Praise begins with uh, Psalm 151, which is composed by David, uh, David speaks about how he was a young boy in his father's house. His you know, fingers fashioned the, the harp and that he went out to meet the Philistine who cursed him with all his idols. But then, you know, I withdrew his own sword and killed him with it. Um, so in Psalm 151, David, a young little boy, is going to meet this giant. He is walking into certain death. Theoretically. Um the first ode of Moses or the first host, which is, again, this is something that we actually say in the Midnight Praise uh, on a regular basis all year round. Um, that's another, you know, the first ode is sung and then the second ode is read. But it's the story of the deliverance of uh, the Hebrews from the hands of the Egyptians when they were stuck, right, with, you know, Pharaoh um, and his army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them. And again, they were stuck in certain death. Uh, next, the prayer of Hannah. Here we, you know, I try to extract the key verses um, that maybe give you a clue about what the church is trying to do here with these readings. So in the prayer of Hannah, uh, she says, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Hades and raises up. Prayer of Habakkuk. The abyss uttered its voice, raising its form on high. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Prayer of Jonah. Out of the belly of Hades. You heard the cry of my voice, the prayer of Hezekiah. I said at the end of my days near the gates of Hades, I shall leave behind the remainder of my years. The prayer of Manasseh, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me, and do not destroy me, nor condemn me to the lowest parts of the earth. The first of of Isaiah, the dead shall rise up and those in the tombs shall arise. Second ode of Isaiah, death prevailed and swallowed them, but again, God wiped away every tear from every face. Third ode, we hope in your name and in the remembrance of you, which our soul desires at night in the darkness. Ode of Jeremiah, woe to us because we sin. Because of this, our eyes have remained in darkness. The three young men, the story of the three young men who are condemned to the fiery furnace because uh, they refused to worship the statue that Nebuchadnezzar made, but they walked in the midst of the flame singing, uh, singing to God and praising the Lord. Prayer of Azariah. Then the three, as if with one mouth saying, glorified and blessed God in the furnace. So again, the, the story of the three whole youth is the story of three people walking into certain death. Okay. And then finally, the story of Susanna. In each of these readings, right, the readings are speaking about somebody that came close to death or was marching towards certain death, but then is redeemed and saved. Whether it's David against Goliath, the Hebrews against Pharaoh and walking through the Red Sea, Jonah in the belly of the whale, the three young men. That's the common thread across all of these readings. And you see mentions of Hades a lot in these readings. There's a reason for that. Because between his crucifixion on Friday and his resurrection on Sunday, Christ did essentially the you can argue the most important work for which he came which is the destruction of Hades the prison in which all of the souls of the righteous were trapped ever since the beginning of humanity and so this is a foundational moment in the story of the salvation effected by Christ in the cross so it's not just the cross and it's not just the resurrection, it's the cross, it's the harrowing of Hades, where everybody was trapped. Hence why you see, right, he descends into Hades, he destroys it, you know, he breaks the, the doors and, and, and the bars of iron, and he lifts up the believers with him. Okay, so it's a monumentous occasion. And so the story of Susanna is one of the stories there. Now, 
You could say the story of Suzanne has many amazing lessons, right? That you could take. It's a story of integrity under pressure, right? She refuses to commit sin no matter what the consequences are. That's integrity. Second, divine justice and providence, that God saves those who call on him, especially if they keep themselves holy. Third, the role of discernment and wisdom. Daniel uses his mind to discover the false witness of the two elders, right? So the notion of the spirit of God working within us in order to give us better discernment as the Holy Spirit did with Daniel. And of course, the consequences of sin, right? For the elders who burn up with desire and then end up dying because of it. They end, well, not only do they burn up with desire, they lie and they falsely accuse someone and then they're stoned to death. So these are all stories that could be learned from the story of Susanna, but actually none of those are the stories, <laughs> the lessons that the church wants us to learn on that specific night. Okay, so on that specific night, the church in her wisdom, okay, and really, this is, I would say, a divinely inspired choice to put this reading specifically in the context of what Bright and Holy Sat, you know, what Bright Saturday or Great and Holy Saturday is all about. As essentially a type for the salvation effected by Christ through the cross and the resurrection and the harrowing of Hades. And so to understand how exactly, we're going to look at Characters, setting, circumstances, and actions. Okay? So we're going to talk about the accusers, the garden, the woman, the law, the certain death, the cry, the young man, the intercession, and finally, the redemption, and not just the redemption, but redemption through reversal, specifically. Okay? It's a very important theme that the story, just like the entire story of salvation, affected on that weekend, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Salvation affected, or redemption affected through reversal. Okay. So let's talk about them. The accusers. The elders deeply desire the beauty of Susanna. They are envious of it, envious that it's not theirs. And so they attempt to take from her what is hers by nature and possess for their own. And then they end up accusing her. The role of the accuser is actually a very specific concept and role in scripture. In the first chapter of the book of Job, we read, and it happened this one day, and behold, the angels of God came to stand before the Lord, and the accuser came among them. I deliberately, by the way, use the word accuser here as that literal translation of Hashatan, Satan. Because the word Satan, or Shatan in Hebrew, means to oppose, obstruct, or yeah. accuse. Just like the elders envied and wanted to possess the beauty of oh, Susanna, no. Satan's envy of the elevated status of humanity after the creation, because they were created in the image and likeness of God, unlike him, caused him to envy humanity. And actually, we hear this in the liturgy all the time. O oh God, the great and eternal who formed men in corruption and death, which entered into the world through the envy of the devil, of the accuser. Okay. And ever since the fall, the accuser not only attempts to, you know, lead those beings that were made in the image of God to sin, but then stands and accuses them of their actions, just like he did with Job in the story of Job. Okay, so the first thing is the accuser, the role of the accuser, right? As exemplified by the elders. Second is a garden. 
It is no wonder that the story is also taking place in a garden. The accuser, in the form of a snake, first attempted to bring the downfall of humanity by first tempting Eve, the woman, in a garden. So Hippolytus says this, thus, just as in paradise, the devil hid in the snake, also now hidden in the elders, it has conceived desire in order to corrupt Eve and you. Okay, so here's a woman, the accuser in a garden. You're going to begin to see that actually what's happening here is a type of the entire story of salvation. Okay. And just like in the garden, the first interaction was between the accuser and a woman. So here also we see a woman. But unlike in the story of the temptation of Eve, here the scriptures want to convey to us how God sees us, not how we actually are. So we're told in the story that Susanna is exceedingly beautiful, beautiful to the point that she kindles that desire in the hearts of the elders. That beauty, this, this is how God sees us. We are icons of God. And here, Susanna is an icon of Sophia. So Sophia, you can think of it as the feminine counterpart or conception of the Logos, which is the second person of the Trinity. Sophia, wisdom, right? So Christ, um, the church tells us that wisdom, Sophia, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, there's a fraction called the fraction of wisdom, and it ends with, you know, wisdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Susanna, in her beauty, is the icon of Sophia, right? So God sees that image, his own image, in Susanna. So the reality, of course, is that, you know, we say that we are icons made in the image of God, but, you know, sin makes these icons covered with dirt and grime, dirt and grime of sin. But through the cross of Christ, God sees the beautiful shimmering icon behind the filth. Okay. Are there things and, we oh. not play to make it so family formation, so there's more children? Um, there's things we could do to help, but almost Sorry. every try has not been able to change fertility rates. There, Dave, you may have to uh, mute something. whoever's talking there. Yeah, I tried. Okay. Whoever has the, it's got the TV running. Okay. There we go. It's, it's not please, clear. everyone, please keep your mute buttons on unless you have a question, of course. Yeah. So through the cross of Christ, God sees not the filth. He actually sees the golden icon beneath that. Restoration of the icon's glory is what he is after. And so the human person is a beautiful person in God's eye, just like the beauty of Susanna. So the beauty of Susanna is what God sees when he looks at us. He sees a people deserving of being saved. Okay, so that's the woman. So we talked about the accusers, the garden, the woman. Now let's talk about the law. The story also shows us the futility of the law, just like St. Paul the Apostle teaches. The futility of the law for salvation. Because it's dependent on enforcement by men, and men are corruptible. The elders abuse their role as enforcers of the law, as judges of Israel, and they bear false witness. And because there's two of them that are independently witnessing, then their testimony holds. Okay? So here, the futility of the law as because it's enforced by men, is shown through the way that they exploit it in order to be able to accuse Susanna. And Susanna herself, she cries out, as she's supposed to, by the way, in Deuteronomy, she's supposed to cry out against the people that are um, trying to attack her, to assault her. But it also doesn't save her. So here we see how the law is futile and salvation must come in some other way from God. Exactly as St. Paul taught. So the accuser, the accusers, the garden, the woman, the law. Next, the certain death. Once the false trial with the false accusations and the false witness that they provide is done, Sophia is, sorry, not Sophia, Susanna is 
for all intents and purposes, a dead woman walking. Her death is absolute and certain. Just like God had warned Adam and Eve, on the day you eat of it, you will die by death, right? Humanity, after the fall, is in the grips of Hades and death, just like Susanna in that moment is in the grips of certain death. She is walking to her death. And it seems like there's no hope. She is, as she said, hemmed in on all sides, just like the Israelites were hemmed in on all sides, just like the three holy youth were hemmed in on all sides by the fire. It's the same thing. This was this is the state of humanity after the fall and under the law, hemmed in, marching towards certain death, condemned to death because of the accuser because of the actions of the accusers. But in addition, certain death, there was a cry. So even in the grips of certain death, the human spirit longs for salvation from God. And it says, but Susanna shouted out with a loud voice and said, God eternal who divines the hidden things, who knows everything. You realize that they have testified against me with lies and look, I will die. Do nothing wrong, and these men um, were maliciously accused me of. So her cry that she lifts up before she is stoned mimics some of the other prayers and cries for salvation from God that is in the scriptures, like in the Psalms. From the deeps, I cried aloud to you, O Lord. Okay. O Lord, hear my voice. So Susanna crying out before her certain death is a type of the groaning of humanity asking for the salvation of God from certain death, even when it seems like there is no way out. Okay, so that's the cry. Next is the young man. Here we see the very interesting verse that God aroused the Holy Spirit of a young boy or young man whose name was Daniel. The Holy Spirit and a young man. Daniel here is a type of Christ with divinity acting in humanity to affect salvation. And this combined force of the divine and the human acting together in concert is the answer that God gives to the cry that Susanna gave before she was stoned. This mimics what God says in Psalm 11, where he says, from the distress of the needy and from the groaning of the poor ones, I will now stand up. And actually this verse from the Psalms is sung in uh, the uh, matins of Great and Holy Saturday, right? For the distress of the needy, I will now rise up. And just like in the story of, um, of um, the Hebrews in, in their slavery in Egypt, God tells Moses what? I know their grief and I have come down to rescue them from the hand of Egyptians, of the Egyptians and bring them out to a land, lead them to a good and spacious land, into a land flowing with milk and honey. So here we see Daniel as a type of Christ the human and the divine acting together to effect salvation, okay? And how does he do it? Well, it's through the intercession. Daniel pleads with the people around saying, I am innocent of the blood of this woman. She did nothing wrong. And he intercedes with them to take a look again at the evidence presented by the accusers. And this is very much as the scriptures teach us about the intercession of Christ before the Father. Like in oh. Hebrews, it says, consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Okay. So Daniel is a type of Christ with the Holy Spirit arising within the man, the divine and human acting together 
to effect salvation and performing an intercession to save this fallen humanity, or in this case, Susanna, who's a type of you know, humanity, from certain death. And finally, after the intercession, there is the redemption. It's a very interesting redemption because what happens through Daniel's intercession, the redemption is affected through reversal. They, the elders, the accusers, were leading Susanna to be killed, executed by stoning. And in the end, what happens? They are the ones that get stoned. Okay? What does that remind us of in the story of salvation? Christ is risen from the dead. By death, he trampled upon death. The theme of the reversal is the overwhelming theme, like salvation during those sacred three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is effected through a reversal. Hades and death think that they have Christ. Christ defeats them by dying. So by death, he tramples upon death. Okay? The accusers take Susanna to her death. They are the ones that end up being stoned to death. It's the reversal. Just like Psalm 151, David goes to meet the Philistine and he ends up killing him with his own sword. Okay? So that's why this theme of redemption through reversal, okay, is very important in the, as a conception of how Christ affected salvation. That he took the the certain death that we were going to go after, you know, uh, have to undergo. He takes it upon himself and he reverses it. He kills death through his own death. Okay. And so the story of Susanna, if we were to re review, is if you were to look at it, step back or, you know, 10,000 foot view. Yes, it's a story about somebody falsely accused who refuses to do the wrong thing, is sentenced to death because of it, and then they are saved miraculously at the end. That is true. But in that specific weekend, on that specific night, as we commemorate Christ doing battle with Hades to free the souls of the righteous from their imprisonment and from certain eternal death, the story here, is giving us a panoramic view of the entire story of salvation. The accuser in the garden deceiving the woman, trying to deceive the woman, right? But the woman is presented as God sees as, as icons of his that are worth saving. The law under which we were living after the fall is ineffectual and leads to our condemnation. We march towards certain death because of the accusations from the accuser. But there's still a faint glimmer of hope where there's that cry that says, oh, God, save me. And God responds by acting through the combined action of the divine and the human, just like he arose the spirit of God in Daniel, who makes intercession for the sake of Susanna and saves her. And in the end, the punishment is reversed and the, accused are, uh, the accusers are the ones that are actually punished by the same punishment, just like death. Christ trampled death by death. Okay? It's a beautiful story. It's very special. There's a reason why the church puts it in that one night specifically. Okay? Giving it this incredible prominence, given that it's very, or, you know, given that it's very rare, you know, not a lot of people know about it. You know, it's read at like two o'clock in the morning on Friday night after everybody's tired. Um but there's an incredible wisdom in the church putting the story as, again, essentially a summary of the entire story of salvation as affected through the cross of Christ. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Abuna, uh, I don't know if you wanted to add something. Well, I, I thought that was uh, amazingly beautiful. Um, the parallels are so stark with uh, the story of salvation. 
Um, you mentioned at the beginning, Sharif, that uh, a lot of the fathers uh, actually commented on this. One of them was Hippolytus of Rome, uh, who who said that you know that the, the woman is like a symbol of the church, and and Christ uh, working through Daniel is saving her, um, and that you know when we see it, like it's a pattern of how you know the devil with uh, Adam and Eve, and the devil through all of humanity. And now the devil dealing with the church, um, who always accuses, you know, asks them, you know, uh, to ask the members of the church to uh, to concede to his way of thinking. And yet the church, uh, you know, refuses to do that and then automatically suffers persecution uh, because of the refusal. But in the end, there is a promise of deliverance and an ultimate victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I, lo I love that uh, that parallel that you you presented. It was amazing. So thank you very much. Uh, you. Is there any uh, any thoughts or questions from anyone online? I'm just wondering why this book was taken out from the the other Bible. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So Origen has this his whole analysis of why. You know, it could have potentially been taken out, and he defends it because he says it's in all of the Bibles that we have. He actually, I think I can I can bring up the exact quote. He says it's in he it's found in the books in all the churches, right? So from his perspective, uh, you know, it's canonical. Um, like I said, there is a conspiracy theory that says that it put the elders of Israel in a bad light because here, right, the elders who are entrusted with protecting the people and safeguarding the law are the ones that you know are acting badly. And so the the story says that, you know, they didn't like that very much. And so it was removed out of the Bible. By the way, to be clear, it's not just that story in the book of Daniel that's taken out. There's other stories. So, uh, well, not other stories, but, well, yeah, there's one more story that's taken out, Bell and the Dragon. But then also the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three holy, holy youth, which we sing as the third host or third canticle during the midnight praise, that is also part of Daniel. In the Bible, but it's also taken out in the Hebrew and the, the Protestant scriptures. Uh, it's not clear why that revision was made. I don't understand the history of the Masoretic text exactly. Uh, but uh, as far as we're concerned, it's in the Septuagint. It's in the Bible that the apostles and the early church fathers used. It's canonical. The fathers of the church defend its canonicity. I don't have an exact reason for why it was removed. Hippolytus of Rome also has that same comment that you mentioned, Sharif, is that, uh, or of the same opinion, that they were ashamed. Uh, they expunged this book from the Bible because uh, it asserted certain things that, you know, that made them, you know, they cast a, a, a negative light on them. So, yep. uh, so, or it could be that they were taken out because of uh, the direct prophecies as well. Uh, there were a lot, including Psalm 151, which you mentioned, was also taken out of the Bible. Yep. Um, as well as different sections of the book of Daniel and uh, and as like Sharif said, other books as well. So, uh, but the church keeps these books. We read them throughout the uh, the year uh, during Lent and, and other parts of the year as well. So uh, it is indeed part of our, our canon. So, um, so, you know, it, it we'll do a study. We, a few Weeks ago, we did a uh, book, um, a Bible study on the Book of Barak, which was another one of the Septuagint books. And again, clear prophecies about Christ and, and his resurrection. And his Reef, incarnation. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, Go ahead. I heard, uh, I don't know how true it is. It was uh, St. Jerome had an issue with the, the story of St. Su uh, Susanna in the fourth century considered it uh yeah i'm not i'm not sure I heard that, so i'm not sure if yeah. how much truth to that but so saint jerome uh was known for like among his awesome amazing writings that he left us he's also known for the vulgate which is the uh yeah. um the translation of the old testament not from the septuagint but from the hebrew version and so that hebrew version didn't have this so. i'm surprised we don't have an icon of her I know the, uh, we, the there uh, are some icons of her. Yeah, we, I've seen some. I have, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
very, that's very. Why I ha- I, that's why I had to use AI to create this icon. I've seen some icons of her, but uh, yeah, that, that's a good AI representation too. Wow, they're getting <laughs> the AI is getting better. Yeah, I can even count five fingers there for most of them. So that's most good. of them. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, there's some you see like the the person on the right here. I don't know how many fingers. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty nice. Um, thank you, oh. Shreve. Any other thoughts or questions? No, it's beautiful. Thank you. So, uh, you know, again, like Shreve mentioned, we will be reading this on Apocalypse Night, bright Saturday, uh, around two a.m. Something like that. It's a beautiful night. I really encourage all of you to attend. Uh, that once in a year uh, experience of, you know, we come back tired from praying all day on Good Friday, we take a little break, and we'll be coming back to church around 11 p.m. and ending with the liturgy that will end around 6 a.m. or so. So, uh, you know, come, even if your kids sleep uh, in the church, just bring them. Uh, It'll be a good experience. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you, Abuna, so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, let's end it. it with a quick prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Thank Spirit, you. Of God. Amen. Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thank you for our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for every man. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only God and Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. The communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Depart in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Sharif. Welcome, Buddha. Night. Thank you.